Welcome to this video. My name is Phil and I'm a senior lecturer in astrophysics at the University of Lincoln and I wanted to kind of go back to exoplanet detection methods and this is a method that can be used that uses two previous methods together to actually work out some interesting things about the orbit and the spin alignment of the star. And what we can actually do here is we can use the transit photometry when the planet passes in front of the star along with the radial velocity method to actually work out the alignment of the orbit of the planet with, in relation to the rotation axis of the star. So let's just have a quick recap on the two methods that we're going to use. So you probably know about these. I'm guessing if you've come to this video, then you already know about transit and radial velocity. But if not, here's a quick recap. So one of the methods we can use to detect exoplanets, in fact, the most common way, actually, where most have been discovered, is if a planet passes in front of a star, it blocks out some of the light. This is called um, transit photometry. So we're look, doing photometric measurements. So we're measuring the brightness of a star. As that planet passes in front of the star, it blocks out some light. We get a nice transit there. And it's a nice symmetric transit if it's a single planet. Now, if we know the orbital period of the planet, we can predict when the next transit will occur. That's going to be very useful. If we know when the transit's going to occur, we can actually use a different or we can use additional observation methods at the same time. So whilst it's actually passing in front, we can take spectroscopic measurements and measure the light of the star as it's going across. So the radial velocity method is where we're measuring the light of the star and we're measuring the Doppler wobble. So we can't generally directly detect the planet, not usually, but we can measure the star. And the star and the planet orbit a common centre of mass. So the planet doesn't orbit the, pla the star, they actually orbit their common centre of mass, the barycentre, but because the star is so much bigger, it just wobbles around, so it doesn't have a very big orbit, but we can measure the Doppler shift of that star, which can be used to detect an exoplanet indirectly. Now, that star will move towards us, and it will be blue shifted, so the wavelength of light is slightly shortened, it becomes slightly bluer, and if it moves away from us, it becomes slightly redder. So that's the Doppler effect and what it does to the actual light. So here, if that star is moving towards us, it will appear slightly bluer. The spectrum of light that we measure becomes slightly bluer. As it moves away from us, it becomes slightly redder. Now, if you measured that for long enough, we would get a cycle in that. So if we were actually to calculate that velocity, it would increase and then decrease. And if it's a circular orbit and it's kind of edge on, we'd get a bit of a sine wave. Now, if you want to calculate what that velocity would be, the Doppler shift, then we need to measure the actual shift in the wavelength, which is at the top here on the right hand side, and then the, well, we do divide by the wavelength. So a typical wavelength in stars might be something like the H alpha line, which is 656.28 nanometers. We'd measure how far away that line is, and then divide it by its actual wavelength when it's stationary, multiply it by the speed of light. That then gives us our velocity. So it's a fairly straightforward equation that we can do here. And if you take lots of measurements, you'll end up with a plot like this, where you've got the radial velocity of the star. Here it's given in meters per second. So that's line of sight velocity. That doesn't take into account the orientation. That's just the line of sight movement we can actually measure. It could be ang angled. We don't know that. And then it's obviously against time. And from peak to peak, that's our orbital period. So we can get the orbital period from that as well. So those are the two methods we can use to detect exoplanets. Interestingly, the transit method will give us the actual radius of the planet because a bigger planet blocks out more light, so we can work out the radius. With this method here, the radial velocity or the Doppler shift, we can get the mass. A more massive planet creates a bigger radial velocity of the star. So we can get mass, we can get radius, but we can also then start to work out the spin orbit alignment as well of the system. So what we're going to do now is we're going to carry out both at the same time. Now, I'm not going to pronounce the effect here because I'm likely going to get that completely wrong. 
but it's given kind of at the, at the bottom there. So we do transit photometry and we do radial velocity at the same time. We know when the transit's going to occur. So we'll measure the radial velocity of that star during the transit. That's going to give us some really interesting information about the system. So that radial velocity is a combination of the movement of the star. So as the planet is orbiting, or the star and the planet are orbiting their common center of mass, then that movement of the star is like the total movement of the star. The star itself could actually be moving as well, away from Earth, just in generally, but it's also wobbling as well. So we get that total movement of the star. But as part of that, the star is also rotating. Now we can't resolve the star quite typically. We can't really image the surface of a star very well as a general rule. Um, so what we do get here is that light we're measuring is a combination of the blue shifted and the red shifted side that's rotating. So here it's rotating and the blue side is rotating towards us. That means that that's blue shifted. So if the side of the star that rotates and moves towards us, it's slightly blue shifted. And on the opposite side where it's rotating away from us, that's slightly red shifted. Now overall, that would be equal or approximately equal. So you have an even amount of blue and red shift occurring there, as well as the total movement of the star. OK, so now if we have a planet that transits across and we're measuring the combined blue and red shifted light of the rotation, that planet will block out some of the blue shifted and then some of the red shifted light. What that does to the star is it makes it appear that it's more blue shifted or more red shifted than it actually is and you'll get a spike where it'll go slightly bluer and then slightly redder as that planet goes across here. Now if the orbit is perfectly aligned with the rotation of the star so basically it's going across the equator like that and yeah pretty much like that then it's going to block out equal amounts of blue and red shifted light like here. Now that plot there is the radial velocity of the star. It's zoomed in on around the transit only this time around, so it's kind of a shorter time period. The dashed line, it's not quite horizontal, but that line across there is the radial velocity of the star. That's the, the movement of the star. The thick black line is basically the radial velocity of the star as the planet goes across. And you can see, first, as it crosses the actual blue part, the part that's rotating towards us, the star appears to be more red shifted and then it will appear to be more blue shifted. Um, or it should, be, sorry, it should be the other way around. Yeah, it should be more red shifted and then more blue shifted. Basically, it blocks out one or the other and then we get um, this kind of shape here and it should be equal. So it should be symmetric about the total radial velocity of the star. Now, if that orbit is inclined, so if you look on the right hand side there, that planet is, its orbit is inclined with respect to the rotation of the star. That means that it's not going to block out equal amounts of blue and red shifted light. So the star is going to appear to be maybe more red shifted than blue shifted or the other way around, depending on how the orbit is actually orientated. So we get an uneven amount of blue and red shifted light being blocked out during that transit. And then actually, if it's really inclined, it may just go across one side. So it may just appear to be more blue shifted than red shifted. So it might, be, it might appear to come towards us than the other way around. So we don't actually detect anything on the other side. So what happens here is we can measure the asymmetry in the blocked blue and red shift light. That can then determine the orbit spin alignment between the planet's orbit and the rotation of the star, just by looking at the asymmetries in this blue and red shift light that's blocked out, essentially. Now, the actual semi-amplitude of this effect, so your delta V here, can be given approximately by this equation here. So you've got the radius of the exoplanet divided by the radius of the star squared, and then you've got the impact parameter B, and then you've got the projected stellar rotation velocity. So depending on the actual inclination, things like that, the rotation velocity, then we will get some amplitude, basically, of this effect. 
Now, what that basically tells us, well, I suppose you can see from the equation here that a big planet that's orbiting around a very fast rotating star is going to give you a bigger amplitude. It's going to be easier to measure. We're going to get a really high signal to noise ratio, basically. But if you can't remember what the impact parameter is, it's just the percentage of the star that the planet passes across. If it goes right across the center, the equator, the impact parameter is zero. It blocks out more light. And if it goes across the edge, it blocks out less light. The transit is shorter. Your impact parameter is one, basically. And it's brighter when it goes across the center because the central part of the star is brighter. As it gets towards the outer part, there's limb darkening occurring. But that's a subject for another video anyway. So finally then, it's giant planets around these rapidly rotating stars that are our best candidates for this particular technique. Because a big planet is, is going to block out more of the actual blue or redshifted light. And then a fast rotating star is going to have a faster rotation. Like, well, obviously. So they're our best candidates. And this one here is Kelt 7b, which is a massive planet orbiting a fairly fast rotating star. So thank you for watching, and if you've got any questions or ideas for future videos, then do let me know in the comments.